Thank you for joining us for another episode of Channel Revelations. I'm Ethan Fox, and I'm here with Michaela Sheldon. We'll be spending the next couple of hours talking to the guides about ancient civilizations and wisdom we can bring to our modern-day understanding as well. As I always say, Michaela is a trans channel, so she will be in a trance and will be speaking directly to the guides. But just so none of this information interferes with our conscious mind, I don't share any of the questions or the topics with her beforehand. So we can start whenever you're ready. All right. All right. And who are we speaking with today? There are a group of many who have assembled in anticipation of this meeting, coming from multiple dimensions and offering Akashic information relevant to the topics that will be discussed. Any particular dimensions or all of them? We are the Council of Light. We are 12th dimensional beings. We are also accompanied by the Pleiadian Collective, many of which reside between the 7th and 12th dimensions. We are also tapping into the Syrian Collective. They resonate mostly in the 9th dimension. So last time we left off discussing the, um, the Naga primarily, and, their, uh, and, and also the Pleiadians, uh, sixth, seventh dimension Pleiadians, I believe, and then from the ninth, and in particular, ancient architecture focused on the dolmens and so on. So I want to um, continue where we left off. And this time, uh, I want to expand our discussion to some of the ancient cities and structures that are in India, for example. So we talked about last time how the dolmens were used primarily as portals by Pleiadians, some Anunnaki, and so on. Um, and um, now, and we also discussed how reptilians tend to generally be uh, inside mountains or high up uh, in areas that are not very easily to access or in, in the ground underneath the earth. Um, now, in India, there are a lot of what they refer to as temples, and we can elaborate on that in a minute, but one in particular, there's a series of caves and, and structures that are extremely elaborate, uh, lots of um, uh, different um, artistry and different gods that are depicted, um, probably some of the most elaborate structures on the planet, uh, and one in particular, the Kailasa Temple in Elora, is was cut into uh, inside of an actual mountain, so um, right into the rock. And uh, it, I assume from our earlier discussions, considering a lot of the Indian gods that are depicted there were reptilian, that this is a reptilian structure, or who who designed this and built this? Primarily, yes. The reptilians that were present on planet Earth were very adept at both designing as well as constructing these types of living quarters and what you now call temples. We might even refer to them as technologies. Uh, however, keep in mind that this was sometimes done with assistance by others who were present on the planet uh, at the time, uh, many of which who may have been uh, intergalactic themselves uh, or hybrid in nature. Okay, and were these uh Nowadays, they are used for worship uh, primarily, but were they originally um, places that these reptilian beings resided, or were they used as places where human beings went to worship them? Well, well, certainly they could be seen as living quarters. We do want to define this terminology because it would be quite different from how you assume uh, to live in your homes today, because remember, you are dealing with beings who have come from another planet, who are existing now in, in foreign lands. And, and this could be um, perhaps the first reason that we would assume to uh, have chosen a, a, a landform like this, because it is not just that the exposure to the plasmic rays of the sun would have been detrimental uh, to their DNA, but also, uh, remember, thriving on a certain level of density 
was also a consideration. And, and again, we are using density here uh, not to refer to uh, something of lower vibration or negative in a sense, but that earthly resonance to be in a slower vibration and a field in which all of the elements and, and the very um, luscious and, and natural resources of earth could be utilized in a technological way. So do they reside there? Yes, but it was more so uh, a, a technology to keep their energy field balanced. So, so intergalactic beings do choose areas that they may call home, but more so what they are attempting to do is find areas in which they can gather with a collective because the collective energy is far more important to them uh, than residing somewhere that is of preference uh, individually, like many of you. In addition to this, you would have found areas that were specifically uh, dedicated to certain types of uh, intentions, like healing or inviting others in to teach uh, or to train because it was more so like a commune or uh, a community uh, than it was a place of, of worship. Later, uh, as the earth evolved and these structures also evolved, they more so became known as a place of worship. Just to clarify what you just said, so the is it fair to assume that reptilians, uh, as an example, the ones who lived in Kailasa, were in a community of many reptilians? So they were they lived together. That is correct. Okay, that does make sense. A lot of the they are depicted as live, having been multiple gods in one location, and there are many different recesses to the structure. Now, what I noticed about Kailasa and other similar structures in India as an example is they have they have certain um, I don't want to call it geometric qualities but but there's certain uniformity in the way the structure looks that um, now is that what you're speaking of in terms of the technology was it built into the structure or was it simply because they were carved into mountaintops or very high uh, elevated areas with more density well, the uniformity you speak of would have been a natural predisposition for any type of uh, resonance, we might say, residence, we might say, for, for a collective of this nature. And, and there are many, many reasons for this. Uh, think today of how humans have fallen out of resonance with Earth. You have designed certain structures using concrete or uh, having harsh angles uh, or not necessarily uh, in resonance with the way that, that energy flows. In these times, uh, who, the reptilians who came from their home star systems uh, brought with them the knowledge of feng shui, for example. Uh, it was not referred to in this terminology, but, but certainly was uh, a prominent part of their architecture, we might say, uh, beyond the earth. Uh, in addition to this, keep in mind that the resonance of a collective space is extremely important to higher dimensional beings, as it should be <laughs> for all dimensional beings, because any space in which multiple uh, souls gather is apt to hold various frequencies or passing energies or residues or thought forms. Uh, we could even say that many of these structures were created very much like a portal or were chosen uh, for their close proximity to an, an inner earth uh, PowerPoint. And for this reason, it would be important uh, for energy to to move and to assimilate and to balance, to keep all who would enter uh, in a state of coherence uh, and also harmony. But from a technological standpoint, uh, much of what you're seeing in the architecture has a very significant purpose as well. 
because the reptilians who resided there, as we've mentioned, um, had hybridized somewhat uh, to become more human or even different than what they um, per were perceived to be of beyond the earth. And because of this, it, it was important to them to have a certain intonation, we might call it, or, or sound harmonic that would hold their energy in a high state of vibration. It is not because they did not understand how to do this themselves, nor were they not uh, seeking out various practices that they could use as agents of harmony, but they were very adept at connecting to the planet and star system in which they had come from. This even goes into some of the collectives that we have been speaking about beyond the reptilians, uh, for example, the, the Anunnaki. Uh, in today's reality, you're seeing a trend of technology interfacing with human beings in some of the most malevolent ways. Consider, though, that technology from a more advanced standpoint and an evolved standpoint uh, is interfacing with the energy of a being in the most beautiful and perfect way. And that is how we see much of this architecture. Uh, it had an intentional and purposeful design to hold the energy field of those who would enter in balance while also keeping the field or the space itself cleared uh, of any residues that would lower the vibration. Okay, I'd like to clarify a few points you made. So are you saying that our understanding of feng shui that we have today originated with reptilians? We can assume that it did in terms of the area in which you are referring to. However, we cannot say that feng shui is exclusively uh, a, a teaching of the reptilians, as many other beings throughout the cosmos uh, have used similar um, philosophies, we might say, not only in their architecture, but, but also within various technological forms of, of healing. And so is this why we see, for example, even the pyramids in Egypt have certain geometric um, a design built into them, certain angles and facing certain directions. Is that all part of that feng shui understanding? From a, a, a more grand uh, overview, yes, certainly. Uh, but we also must recognize that some of these are codes. So if you are to um, put all of the temples and pyramids into one category and say that every marking upon them, that that is geometric in design is for the purpose of feng shui, uh, that would be an, an overarching definition. Uh, as we know that some of the pyramids uh, held codes and these codes were Akashic in their relevance, meaning they were capturing a, a certain translation of a timeline or the ability to activate DNA. Uh, even the gods and the goddesses who were present at the times in which the, these were born would have wanted to capture their own legacy um, in, a, in a language of light that is now seen as a sacred geometric code. So there is some variance here, uh, we believe, depending upon the site, but the common thread uh, is certainly the, the philosophy of feng shui or keeping the energy in a very high resonant and cosmic state. Is our understanding of feng shui today that's being used worldwide still in that same alignment or um, obviously it's the part of the wisdom that's lost is that it was part of a bigger picture, right? But is, is the aspect that we're using today useful at all? We see fragmentation of these ideas and, and a great deal of influence as well that have taken them out of context. And it's not to say that in, in, today's reality and this timeline that that feng shui shouldn't be adapted uh, to what is useful now because in, in every dimension and every timeline teaching somewhat shifts slightly in, in order to support uh, the consciousness of the beings who are present 
But unfortunately, we have also noticed some tampering here of some of the original teachings and insights of what feng shui is not carried out in every individual or group of, of beings who are teaching it, but somewhat like the biblical translations we've been alluding to in past conversations. Um, feng Shui uh, and the direction of it coming from many cosmic star systems uh, is very much told like a story. Uh, it is not a directive that can be traced back to something instructional that could be um, uh, relayed in a, in a linear sense today. So, so what we might say is those who are practicing feng shui are, are all doing so through their own unique translation of it, uh, very much like how religion has transitioned throughout time. Is it fair to say that feng shui, as it was used by the reptilians and perhaps other ancient civilizations, the purpose is, is to maintain or optimize the well-being of the individuals existing in that space? It is, absolutely. And, and the idea of coherence comes into this. We know it isn't exactly what humans are striving for today. Uh, health has become the main focus and the priority, but, but in a coherent state, beings have little worry about upkeep of their physical bodies because when you exist in coherence, you are existent in alignment with the source field. And from that state of alignment, uh, all that is needed is presented to you in a, in a very literal fashion. This is perhaps the main reason that the reptilians and others were, were striving to implement uh, these tools uh, into their architecture because they sensed, some of them at times, that they had themselves lost touch with the source field only because they found themselves in different dimensions and different timelines in which what they knew before had shifted so drastically. So any, um, anything that they could put into practice that would be helpful to maintain their connection organically to the universe uh, was, was something that was strived for uh, by these collectives. As we've discussed before, that the Buddhist and Hindu religions, as examples of different Indian religions as well, originated from the reptilians. Is it reasonable to say that the, a lot of the chants and such that are used in these different religions, uh, in particular the Buddhist religion, has certain kinds of chants, that those were also used by the reptilians in order to maintain this optimal state for them? They are, yes. There is a direct correlation here that, that we affirm. And of course, uh, imagine the focus that we have brought forward on the inner technology. This is the true purpose of why these chants originated, uh, both on Earth as well as in other star systems, because to activate the inner technology, sound is one of the most efficient modalities. And the reptilians took this to heart and, and used sound through the vessel of their own bodies to create the coherence that feng shui would hold in a space. So, so it is no, truly no different than the archaeology uh, or the, um, um, the various designs that you are speaking of, because if we were to see within the inner technology as a chant was being spoken, uh, what we might see is the very same geometric designs uh, appearing uh, within bodily waters uh, or even within the resonance of heart in a very measurable way. So, so this was something brought to earth not only to support um, this level of coherence we speak of, but, but to truly help humans to rise above some of the circumstances that they were facing at the time, because reptilians are known uh, as healers and, and shapeshifters. And to have been human at the time in which reptilians were present and especially known for some of the, the religions and the chants that you bring to our attention, uh, would have been a struggle very similar to what you face today. 
uh, not in the same way uh, regarding certain diseases that could be named necessarily, but, it, but especially in the idea of separation and feeling lost and confused and, and not having a direction or, or a purpose in life. Uh, the chants and the various intonations of these chants uh, awaken a soul's access to not only its Akashic records, but but its own divine plan, uh, somewhat like an inner compass that is is being uh, realigned to to the earth. Now, do these chants, as they were used by reptilians for that purpose, do they benefit humans in the same way, or is it primarily just more to move us toward a more reptilian uh, consciousness? Well, it, it does certainly depend a bit on the chance that you're referring to. And then, of course, there are many and they have evolved into this timeline well beyond uh, their their original state. In In our minds, we see a true genetic hybridization that has taken place between reptilians and humans, which might scare some who are listening. And, and we see positives and, and negatives for this, certainly, because if left to your own, uh, humanity would have evolved beyond the resemblance of, of the structure of any one of its cedar families. But the close proximity uh, and influence of reptilians turned on more of a genetic predisposition to their likeness. So in the chanting, certainly some of the same chain of events uh, would have happened with humans as reptilians at, at varying levels of degree. But the mind must also come into this uh, discussion because of course, reptilians have, have mastered mind. It, it is a part of their uh, technology and structure that helps them to manifest and to shape shift and to astrally attune to the multidimensional universe. Uh, humans have also been given a very um, incredible mind uh, through which some of the similar activities that reptilians are able to accomplish uh, can also be uh, brought to fruition. At the same time, as we chant and tone, we're awakening parts of us beyond the mind. So where some of these chants and tones would have helped the reptilians higher mind, um, humanity operates a bit differently. It would have accessed even some of the lower chakras and the realms in which life force channels through these various locations within a human structure. And that includes the emotional body. So even today, when humans are implementing these chants, where they think it is taking them out of mind uh, and helping them to, to even travel beyond the body, there can be some movement of energy having to do with emotional traumas or or where there have been blocks for example for very long periods of time so so this might be the distinction we would say is that humans uh, are, are operating more in the fullness or meant to operate more in the fullness and connection of an emotional body than reptilians are so sound as a modality is naturally going to operate slightly differently but ultimately, this is why we have a very mind-based global society today, I assume, is because of the reptilian influence. Whereas, as we've discussed in previous conversations, the key to our um, uh, ultimate progress is developing the emotions more. But, it is, so, yes. Yeah. But, but we live in a mind-based society because of that reptilian influence. Correct. So um, how is it that the reptilians had such a strong influence on our mind-based society, even though we pretty much live in more of an Anunnaki-based um, global financial system and, uh, and governmental structure and so on? That, that's not reptilian, it seems like. Well, this is quite a, a long answer, and, and we'll summarize by saying that 
not all of the reptilians who have come to planet Earth have had a, a more benevolent focus to supporting and assisting human healing. Uh, remember, there was a great cataclysm at the very beginning of the, the Earth's formation in which reptilians found themselves in a, in a very dire situation. And many came and took up home in the inner Earth and, and are not doing as well as the ones who have continued to evolve um, and are still in assistance of humanity even beyond the Earth. So. So when we talk about reptilians um, very much like, like humans, there are a spectrum of beings at various levels of consciousness and vibration and dimension and intention uh, here on planet Earth that are um, influencing what you speak of. Okay, getting back to the architecture itself, now many of these structures that are in particular in the area we discussed in India um, they were carved very intricately into mountains, areas, or rocks, as we discussed. It's because of the density of that material. But it's, and it seems like, and we've sort of touched on this in previous conversations, so I just want to sort of reiterate those topics and, and see if we get more clarity. Uh, you mentioned that they used their inner technology to essentially create these um, structures and use every element of material that was removed in order to create these elaborate carvings uh, to actually build, a, uh, to put back into the structure itself to create a certain frequency. But was there any kind of, um, so this was entirely mind-based or was it, uh, was there any kind of technology beyond the inner technology that was used to remove this material because in some areas where these structures exist you can sort of see some sort of uh, look like tool marks um, or scooping marks um, which of course could be mine based too so can you give us more clarity on that yeah to start with the the tool marks we want to be very clear that that much of this came later so so these were individuals that were either attempting to prove or disprove some theory about the way in which the structure was built or may have simply come to, to degrade it in some way. Because if we go back to the origins of these, these immaculate temples, uh, there would have been no evidence of any markings of, of this kind. But we have brought to your attention the inner technology. And we do want to go back to the reptilians origin and, and talk about um, what they left behind uh, as they came to the earth. And, and again, try to relate it to modern day technological advances. For example, your 3D printers. Uh, this is something that has come into this timeline and, and can be used in very advantageous ways to create things with little effort or, or less effort than perhaps what it may have taken before. Imagine starvings and, and families like the reptilians having lived lifetimes well beyond even the, the origination date of planet Earth and going through all of these various periods of technological advancement. What you are facing today with the interface of artificial intelligence and the human body is not the only timeline in which this has happened. The interface of technology with living cosmic beings has happened across the board to, throughout the cosmos in many different dimensions. But the intention behind it was not malevolent always. In fact, many of these beings had merged with intelligent technology to such a degree that they became the essence of it, meaning their ability to focus on an end result in a collective sense and harmonize their structures at one could create miraculous results in a material fashion. And this is essentially what you are seeing, the download of a template that was collectively envisioned, brought into the third eye of the master reptilians that were present on the planet. These were elders that 
had been a part of their star system long before they even arrived on planet Earth. And through the connection of their energy fields, they were able to take this design no uh, less uh, immaculately than the 3D printer we have talked about and put it into fruition, making it something very tangible. Yet, of course, this did not happen overnight. So, so what you believe came into full fruition uh, instantaneously may have taken several years as chambers uh, were envisioned and carved out and then the residues were left behind and those residues were blessed as a part of the entire structure and the beings would gather around those residues using them as the energy force through which the next chamber was designed so so you're seeing the result of the focused intention and energetic union of multiple reptilian beings or, or even others um, using the power of what they had achieved in lifetimes before in one um, focused endeavor. And, and this is the result of many of the temples that you see today. Now, we also want to account for sound because we do believe sound was an important part of the construction of these various quarters. And the sound both came from an audible chant that those that were focused on the construction uh, would uh, sustain for days at a time, but also the Earth's mimicking of that. So, so remember, these sites were not chosen randomly. Uh, they were seen from ships and through astral vision as being some of the most important uh, areas where ley lines would cross and, and energy was tangible or even access to Gaia's crystalline core was, was easily available. And this was capitalized on because Gaia is mimicking the resonance of, of all beings on planet Earth. And the reptilians and others on Earth had great understanding of this well beyond even humans today. What you perceive as your Schumann resonance, for example, is, is a capture of the coherent energy of every living being on planet Earth today, including nature. But there are some who understood how to direct this, how to work with the earth itself and use it as a technology to focus uh, towards their end goal. So, so a variety of different techniques that were used, uh, but all um, merging together in order to result in the most perfect and, and beautiful temple. As I mentioned, Kailas, the temple is part of a series of cave systems that are in that area called Elora Caves. And now the Kailas, the temple is the most elaborate and um, uh, ornate of all the designs, whereas many of the other ones are on the outside appear to be just simple caves. They're very rough on the outside, but the inside is very intricately detailed. So why was the, the Kailasa temple in particular so elaborate compared to some of the other ones that just look like caves? And even many places around the world, as we discussed last time, like the Grand Canyon, on the outside of these structures, they just look like caves or holes in the side of a mountain. They don't really look all that elaborate, even though inside they can be very intricate. Why, why the difference? Well, what you may be seeing here is the difference between what was created uh, artificially by the reptilians that were present and and the land formations that came into being during the actual construction which may have had more of a, a rough or rugged appearance remember there was a great deal of land shifting going on with various elements and rocks and and crystal it would have been natural that the structure itself, for example, a mountainous range, uh, would have consciously attuned that energy into something 
purposeful to support the endeavors of those that had taken home within it. Uh, this is something also not often recognized today. Uh, many of you take for granted um, these land formations like the Grand Canyon, for example, or uh, various portals in Sedona. But these are actual conscious beings. They are a part of the earth that has become intelligent. And it, within that intelligence, there is an opportunity to interface with anything else that is intelligent and, and working for the benefit of the whole of the earth. So in some of these caves that are more rugged, there would not necessarily be a presence of the reptilian elders or, or the ones who were perceived as gods or masters. The internal, more elaborate construction uh, was created for them, but, but also for the entry of others who would benefit from it. The outer caves uh, that would lead to passageways, for example, were entry points, and these were also guarded, uh, as we have mentioned before, uh, by dragons uh, at times and also individuals who were students uh, or had somewhat volunteered themselves to support the reptilians who were on earth. Many of them were chosen, for example, uh, to be supportive in terms of the cleansing and clearing of these various spaces, meaning those who would enter the inner structure first had to go through a series of initiations and purification and even spending time in the area itself to actually receive the vibrational upliftment uh, of it. So, so when we see the difference here, we also uh, want to allude to the idea that uh, the weather and the changes in the weather may have also facilitated some of the um, appearance that you're noticing because uh, the inner chambers were so very much protected, we might say. Uh, they did not receive the harsh um, elements as much as some of the ones that were more exposed uh, to sunlight, for example, or uh, were considered to be waiting areas uh, or entryways. Okay, just so make sure I understand. Um... Are you saying that the elders tended to live in the more elaborate, like Kalosa Temple, which looks like, a, in some respects, a palace that was carved into rock, whereas some of the other ones that are more just look like basic caves on the outside but are elaborate on the inside might have been um, lesser reptilians in a manner of speaking? Yes, we agree with that. Okay. And so... Would these more elaborate structures like the Kailasa Temple have been occupied by what we might consider royalty in, in the reptilian race? Yes, we, we could use that terminology. Would that generally be the case then when we see elaborate structures like that and, and that are reptilian in nature around the world, that it was the more either the more uh, advanced or the elders or the royalty of the reptilian race that resided in those locations. Yes, and we, we even want to remind you of the, the collective nature of these areas, which could also be referred to as families. So there may have been a direct lineage between those who would enter the, the inner and more elaborate parts of the caves uh, versus those that would remain um, beyond. Okay. Would that also explain, and so you're talking about the collective nature, would that have been within one structure, meaning Kalasa Temple would have been a group of reptilians that were part of a collective, but does it also apply to the fact that there are a series of other caves right in the same area, but not in the Kalasa Temple? Correct. Correct. This would um, demonstrate that there were some meant to... Um, live in close proximity due to their lineage or, or various knowledge and power uh, and others who were in close proximity but not necessarily a part of that collective. Now with reptilians, 
what constitutes royalty because we know at least we can tell from Anunnaki it was more a power thing that was assigned from individual to individual based on their ability to uh, fight wars or uh, overpower one another essentially more an element of force and war um, with reptilians is the notion of royalty something different or is it the same it is and we have been using the term elder to to refer to the idea that that these were beings who had received the wisdom and the teaching of of those that had gone before them uh, and had been prepared and trained uh, in the ability uh, to share those with more than their own families uh, in fact we might say that many of them uh, had very um um, specific energetic abilities that were reminiscent of their home planet and were able to master them on earth uh, in an environment that was completely different and and in these days it was not easy uh, for a, a being to come through a portal and to hybridize into a different form and then to gather all of its wisdom and and information and put it to use uh, in a new way, uh, we might say these elders were able to to bypass the need to have to go through a transformation that took them out of the context of what they had ever known before, or may have created any type of lag time uh, in their ability to use their powers as they had learned before. And, and what we now know is that this had to do with a certain detectable quality of their auric fields. We've alluded to uh, the idea of plasma in, in many of our past discussions, and, and we want to reintroduce it here because there is a very distinguishing quality with those who were considered royalty or elders versus those who were not in their ability to access their plasma. In fact, it was often seen as a very tangible uh, light and elixir that that others would recognize uh, within their field. Uh, they were able to transmit this energy, uh, offering it to others, yet they were very careful in who they would have chosen to do this with because the power was so great and it was so intense that those on planet earth that had been led astray may not use it for the benefit of the whole and and this is also why the collective energy was so important um, we don't want to say these were secrets necessarily but the 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 plasmic connection that this collective had was was so powerful and so akashic in its relevance to the higher dimensions that it orchestrated feats of magic and these feats of magic could be used for good or bad <laughs> so so we are referring to those in the inner caves as as having this certain plasmic quality whereby they were able to pass between dimensions or exist in multiple dimensions without losing any perspective of what they had learned before or who they were before. And we use the example of humans today. Uh, when you incarnate as a soul on planet Earth, you come in without remembrance of who you were before and what you have learned in multiple lifetimes. Some of you along the way will have great awakenings of this, but it has to do with plasma because when you come into a density like Earth, um, even a third dimensional reality that has a great deal of density in terms of thick energy, it is very difficult to access the plasma and to use it to time travel and shape shift and move between dimensions. The reptilian elders had so much of it that they were able to uh, move through the plane of earth and continue to ascend and not forget who they were and use it as one of the most powerful agents of transformation. All right, just so that we don't have any confusion about the idea of plasma, first of all, is there any relationship between, because modern times when people hear the word plasma, they think of blood plasma, 
Is there any relationship there to what you're talking about? Uh, and what exactly is plasma, if you can give a more concise explanation? We are referring to an etheric elixir that is vibrational in nature and that accompanies a soul into any form that it chooses and interfaces with that form in an intelligent way to help it access the multidimensional universe. So, so plasma beyond the body that exists within the auric field is a tangible and measurable substance that supports the light body to move beyond the field in which it is attending. And this is why many of you today are having such mystical and intergalactic experiences. The plasma that is coming to the earth from the great central sun and that you are generating through breath as you practice meditation is becoming more and more activated. And because of that, your time traveled events are becoming far more visceral. You do have plasma within the body, and this is a very unique part of the human structure because you are physical beings. And that cellular plasma is important. It does interface with your vibrational plasmic field and helps you to have a true physical and visionary experience. For example, on a, on a ship, uh, those of you who have been um, either uh, taken or requested to go on a, on a ship beyond the earth have been using both your plasma in the body as well as beyond the physical field in order to accomplish this. But the reptilians being, um, we'll say, focused on the inner technology so um, much had developed their plasma to a certain state in which it did not diminish with their entry into a physical plane. Reptilians do not have cellular plasma uh, like humans do, but it is not necessarily needed. Uh, in other words, their structure has evolved beyond the need for plasma in this physical way, and they they truly only rely on the plasmic field beyond their own body. So, so as humans evolve, we think this could happen as well, but it isn't necessarily something that has to happen, nor is it a very important part of your record. Uh, what is more important is that you are now focused on the the various technologies and spiritual modalities that help you to access the plasma beyond the body. Because of this, you are um, preparing, we might say, for the idea of disclosure uh, or being able to interact in the fifth dimension with any other beings that you choose. Now these, um, you mentioned that it was typically the royalty that lived in these uh, in temples like the Kailasa temple. Uh, in the reptilian lineage now, do do those bloodlines still exist today? And I assume they're world leaders, or are they still living in the earth or somewhere far away where we don't know about them? Well, these bloodlines must still exist because any species on planet Earth that has contributed to creation is going to be a part somehow of future generations. But but we do want to distinguish between some of the elders that had a benevolent intention and focus for humanity and the ones that we referred to earlier that exist within the inner earth and may have not been so um, positively focused for the human collective. This we believe is where you're seeing some of the continued lineage in various families uh, that you understand to be reptilian. But certainly, uh, even those that were more enlightened have carried on in, in various teachers and, and even rulers at times throughout the earth. Um, it is not necessary that we have to distinguish between one or the other, but to know that the lineage itself, not, not unlike your own family lineage, is going to, uh, like a vibrational wave, shift with whoever assumes it. Because uh, it is not just the lineage that is seated within you that predetermines what you will be. 
but the consciousness that perceives the lineage and actually determines the level to which it changes that creates something anew. So, so what we're saying here is we see varying levels of the reptilian lineage still existing on planet Earth in various families and even uh, those in prominent positions of power, but the degree to which they are using it, aware of it, or have changed it is completely different. So based on that, they wouldn't have the same access to plasma that they did in the past in these ancient times. Is that correct? It is dependent uh, upon the understanding of those who exist in a reptilian family. And, and we will give you some direct examples here. And, and we know many would consider the royal family, for example, to be a part of a reptilian lineage. And it can very easily be distinguished in some of their characteristics that, that this connection has remained. The question is, are they aware of their ability to shape shift and to use plasma for their own benefit and the benefit of others? That awareness would certainly be a part of their experience because to be perceived as royalty, you would have received all of the Akashic wisdom in order to assume that position. But again, the question is, is the consciousness there? in order to take that knowledge and to put it into some very beneficial use. What you're seeing more so is that the plasma is being focused on in a, in a negative intent. It is being used to create certain events that are more harmful to humanity than they are helpful. And even those who exist in a highly plasmic state must consider that they are more hybrid than they are reptilian and they have assumed more of a physical density than a light body and for this reason um, if they are not practicing in the ways of their elders or ancestors uh, may actually not have as extensive of a plasmic body as what the elders before them did. And we have noticed some of this as well. Um, it is interesting, the reptilian lineage, because if you go back to the very beginning or the origins of their race, what you might find is they are not only shape shifters, but, but they are collectively sentient beings that are using their own life force for the benefit of every other party in the collective, meaning they're very in tune with how their energy is either supporting what they desire for all or detracting from it. And because of that, they become more enlightened in their use of exchanging energy with another, meaning they see very clearly whether or not they are slighting someone of their life force and gathering it for their own power or if they are actually able to restore it. So some of the more revered um, elder reptilians who you may have found in these temples were known as healers because of this idea of restoration. They were able to offer a transmission through their own plasma and their own life force to another that would have an immediate restorative effect even on their physical bodies. But some in power may use this in reverse and in doing that, they're actually depleting themselves. So, so some who have remained in power, who don't have humanity's best interest in mind, are very aware of their plasmic abilities. They have been turned against humanity and they're attempting to use them to, to bring power to themselves. But in so doing, they're actually weakening their own bodies. And, and this has even come to light. So. So much of what you're seeing in terms of the need to um, rule at a time on planet Earth when there is so much going on in order to accomplish this ruling, we might say that underneath it all is fear. It, it's the realization of how power has, being been, has been used and is being exchanged in, in detriment uh, to those who are actually assumed to have it. Now, you mentioned that the, we believe that the royal family is part of this reptilian bloodline. 
Now, is, is that identified uh, by the fact that they seem very unemotional and cold in their um, demeanor? Is that one way to identify uh, bloodlines that are still from the reptilian lineage? And this would be a translation of how a reptilian hybridizes with a human. It is the absence of empathy or the inability to actually translate information through any sense of emotion. And this is quite an extreme, we might say. And and this is what you've noticed throughout space and time at varying levels and degrees within the whole of humanity. There's another element of ancient mythology that seems to be associated with reptilians, but it's also associated with Anunnaki, and that's the use of gold. Now, it seems like the Anunnaki were mining for gold, but if we look at a lot of ancient mythology, it seems like reptilians, in particular dragons, seem to hoard gold. Um, what is the significance of that? Is Or is that just a made-up storyline? Well, there are different reasons dependent upon the, the race and their their focus of intention, and, and we want to speak to a few of them, knowing, of course, that, that gold is an intergalactic resource. So, so beyond Earth, uh, even before Earth became a, an inhabited planet, um, gold was an, an intergalactic resource that was brought to Earth and seeded here in order to hybridize. We want you to all imagine the formation of a galactic core and, and what that would include, a core magnetizing cosmic elements and in a, in a sense of fusion, bringing them together to, to create a consciousness. And, and gold is a part of that galactic core. The value of the gold on Earth to uh, races like the reptilians uh, or the Anunnaki, it has more to do with how gold hybridized on the planet and became a very rich and valuable resource in a physical sense. It is not to say that the Anunnaki did not have gold in their own star system. They certainly did. But when they came here, they began to realize that the gold on planet Earth held a very supernatural quality. While it was very dense in its material presentation, it also was able to hold a great deal of light, meaning that it could be used as a programming technology. Uh, both to be placed with, within their own bodies as well as brought back to their planet and help to restore areas that had been destroyed. Even we see the, the quality of purification and detoxification in gold being a very valued source, both within the Anunnaki and the reptilians, as well as many ancient civilizations on planet Earth. But the reptilians had a different purpose for gold. Uh, they saw the ability to use it as an agent of enlightenment. And, and remember, they were great alchemists. What they were doing with the mind and with sound in order to create the perfect feng shui within a temple, this possibility was actually seen in using gold as an ingestible format during their ceremonies, meaning they could use gold in various states of alchemy to create the coherence on earth that some of them missed from their star families. It is not to say that that coherence had to be at a certain high level, but the higher and higher that it went, the more and more powerful uh, they became. There is also a very important uh, infusion, we might say, within the physical body between gold and the heart. We mentioned that the reptilians were using a high heart, a, a matrix through which they were able to assume a connection to another because emotion was something they had evolved beyond. And gold has a very intergalactic quality in relationship to that high heart. It helps the soul to become far more sentient in its ability to translate energy and to use it for the betterment of itself. There's somewhat of a recyclable um, uh, design that this high heart offers. Um, many of you might refer to it um, as a Taurus, for example, that um, 
recycles energy, brings energy in and helps it to flow out. The reptilians saw great value in using gold uh, as an agent of this flow. It was also incorporated in their temples for a similar purpose. And this had to do with its resonance. Um, it is very much like today, if you were to surround yourself in your home with very decadent crystals or powerful uh, quartz, uh, you would change the quality of the energy within the home itself. And, and this could have a profound effect on the way that you create and see your own life and even and heal your body. Uh, gold was perceived this way uh, by the reptilians. Getting back to the uh, architectural conversation we had earlier, now, there are many um, structures around the world, all very different in their orientation and design with similar qualities as well. So one in particular in Ethiopia, there is the Church of St. George, which is, again, another, uh, it's a very small structure, though, compared to Kailasa Temple. But this one is not a cave, but in similar fashion to Kailasa Temple, it is actually carved into a mountain or into the, the rock itself, where it's a three-dimensional structure, very elaborately carved, but not as much detail as, say, Kailasa Temple. But the fact that it's carved into rock and um, and sort of looks like it could be it could have been a place where someone lived as well, would that also be reptilian in nature? Uh, it, it is, but also um, more human hybrid in its presentation. Uh, keep in mind that as time went on, uh, there were many humans who were extremely interested in learning from the reptilians the skills that they had observed uh, both within the construction of these temples as well as their ability to heal. So locations were chosen where uh, groups of humans, those who had been chosen or were prepared, uh, could interface with the reptilian elders. Uh, and these were smaller areas, not necessarily because the size was important, but more so because the physical nature of them was, was more suited uh, to those who would um, assume uh, positions of, of students or those who were being trained. Uh, it is seen somewhat like a church and assumed that those who would gather there would worship others. And later, of course, uh, this came to be uh, only because in these mountainous ranges, um, those that wanted to assume positions of power uh, found themselves in high-lying places to not only have serenity or, or peace, but, but to be seen as that position of power. Um, it would take days, uh, weeks, even months to pilgrimage to some of these locations. And there were ships even at times that were assigned to helping those at the on the ground level or in certain geographic regions to to reach these places. Um, this location, it um, took a more physical presentation simply because uh, it was meant to be more physically accepted or seen as uh, a variance uh, between these inner temples that were known only for those of a certain level of power uh, and those who are being trained. What's the significance now? this particular, what they call a church, obviously um, that's a modern adaptation of the structure, but it's, it is it is shaped like a cross, unlike all the temples we've discussed in India that have very elaborate, ornate design uh, and really nothing in terms of a cross. Whereas in Ethiopia, this particular structure, among others around the world, is shaped like a cross. Is there any significance to why the reptilians would have chosen that design in this case? It, the cross isn't necessarily significant in terms of the activities that went on there. But, but again, if we are to go back into ancient history and we're taking you more into the cosmos, uh, the cross is seen as, as a very iconic symbol of universal balance. Now it has been ad, ad, 
adapted uh, beyond this to mean other things. But but as it came to Earth, this symbol was to represent areas where complete and total energetic balance could be found, either within the structure itself, or this was the goal of those who were um, uh, uh, taking up residence there to share certain teachings with others that would accomplish this. Uh, we might even say that the cross in very early forms of construction uh, was a symbol of transcendence, meaning this was a place in which those that were coming to study would transcend a certain level of knowledge uh, and be able to step onto the, the next level, uh, whatever that may be. Uh, for example, to study under an elder, there would have been a process, um, very much like an initiation, that humans, hybrids, or, or others would go through prior to, to meeting the elder. And this may have been a place that that preparation work was initially done. Is the idea of priesthood itself that now is prevalent among religions all over the world, did that originate with the worship of reptilians as a priest's class? Some of it, yes, but not all of it. We cannot account for every bit of the religious interpretation that that would be included in this statement. Yet we also know that there were so many that were interested in understanding the power of those elder reptilians that they took on what is called a priesthood, meaning they gave their lives up to service and even spent uh, a great deal of time fasting, for example. Um, they would chant for very long periods of time in order to energetically cleanse and prepare themselves for further initiations that they would receive. And, and many of these activities still remain today in, in the priesthood itself. So, for example, if we take Egypt as a separate example, uh, Egypt was known to have uh, a priest class as well. Uh, so are you saying that the priest class in Egypt wasn't necessarily reptilian? It could have been any number of different kinds of beings. There, there were reptilians in Egypt, yes. Not all of them um, were necessarily elders, however. And we do see a priesthood there that, that followed both the reptilians that uh, were known to have brought their teachings to this area, but, but also other hybrid gods. Um, this is why you have so many different religions on planet Earth today. Separately, there is a, there's another location I want to discuss, which is uh, Petra in Jordan. And again, the similarity of architecture is that these buildings or structures are carved into rock, uh, into the sides of um, rock faces, for example, but the architectural design is very different from what we see in India or what we see in Ethiopia in that they more closely approximate what we might see in government buildings or in the United States and other parts of the world today. They have columns and um, triangular shaped, shaped roofs, which is very much like our um, our governmental buildings today around the world. And um, w was this also reptilian or some other race? This was not reptilian. Um, but what we notice about these structures, uh, going back to their the very beginning in which they were, they were constructed, is that there have been multiple races that have utilized them for different purpose. But their original construction is through the Pleiadians. Now we've talked about the Pleiadians a little bit in terms of the seventh dimension, but we want to take this up into the ninth dimension just for a moment, because some of the pillars that you see uh, even today in government buildings are actually a symbol of how energy is directed in various star systems like Pleiades, for example. Uh, there are, uh, within the Pleiadian star system, uh, a variety of different power points, uh, no less important than the ones that you find on Earth. And what Pleiadians throughout time have known is that if the energy can flow in a specific configuration, uh, it can be captured and used for the benefit of all. 
And then columns came into being for this very purpose. But the, the column is more a hollowed out area through which energy flows and creates a sound. Now that sound might not be extremely detectable by the human ear, for example, but nonetheless may be sent up into a pyramid-like structure where it is shared with the rest of the universe or can be directed by those within the structure uh, in order to suit a specific intention. And, and these were actually observation and research areas within which uh, certain fields and portals were being simulated. Uh, and this is why the columns and the rectangular roofs were used. Later on, these areas, they may have been used for uh, a different purpose, and, and we could account many, of course, throughout time. Uh, but whenever you see this, this type of construction, always keep in mind that it's somewhat a technology, and it is not just Pleiadian in its history. Uh, there have been many different galactic races throughout time that have used a similar construction. Even the angels, for example, notice that within the heavens, columns of this nature exist. There are actually energy centers or areas where there are stargates. And they actually um, denote, for example, uh, doorways that can be opened with a certain key code. So all of this has come to Earth as a mirror reflection of cosmic history. Well, this may may or may not be true in many of the locations such as Petra, um, but in most cases where the columns have been destroyed, where we can see the internal workings, they were not hollow. So does that make any difference in what you're saying? The, the hollow nature is not always required on a dense physical planet, and, and this is why the material structure itself would have been imbued in sound, meaning there may have been a specific type of material that was used. Uh, crystal may have been embedded within the column itself. There may have even been a coil at the very base of the column that would have sent energy upward. So, so the design itself in terms of the hollow nature isn't always the most important consideration. What is more important is how the energy is directed through it and the various means that are used. We've discussed a number of times, including today, about how reptilians typically prefer more dense materials like rock, and that's why they choose mountains or caves and underground. But why would the Pleiadians choose a similar environment to build a structure like this where it's, again, it appears to be intricately carved into rocks um, in similar fashion as reptilians. This has more to do with the atmosphere that they were able to thrive in. And the reptilians, they were able to thrive in, in various areas on the earth. It was just more or less a preference. The, the Pleiadians that come to the earth today are, are very different than the ones who were here um, early on in the Earth's history. Uh, the Earth has changed greatly, so you must always keep this in mind when we are answering these questions, because those that would have come initially uh, may have been uh, more attuned to a physical environment, simply because in Pleiades there are those who choose a, a more physically dense dimension uh, and others that do not. There was a great interest, um, not only on behalf of the reptilians, but also the Pleiadians in mountainous areas that were seen as land formations able to channel energy from deep within the earth. This, these areas that were cleared out that were rock and material uh, may not have been as difficult to clear as what you may think. As we've mentioned, the reptilians being able to use coherence and the inner technology and modality of sound, many of the Pleiadians and other cosmic collectives were actually using light ships and the plasma technologies on these ships uh, to create these various structures. 
Now, we've, we've established in many conversations how the iconography we see in different nations around the world, such as the United States, which has the eagle uh, with the um, snake in its talons. We also see the same kind of uh, iconography in different parts of the world, which looks more literal, where you can actually see the snake, where in the, in the U.S. it looks more like a ribbon. Um, so it's obvious that there is this carry forward of this primarily Anunnaki lineage in the U.S. and other countries like Tibet, they have the snake iconography, which makes sense because Buddhism prevails there. Um, but I'm trying to understand how is it that if the uh, Pleiadians are the ones who are responsible for this building architecture uh, with pillars and the triangular shaped roof, which then carried forward into Rome and Greece. And, and now we see it in, even in our United States, um, different um, buildings in our governmental uh, region in Washington, D.C., for example, and other parts of the United States as well. But it's a very specific kind of architecture that we see primarily in government institutions and things of that nature. How is it that the Pleiadians' architecture got carried forward if we're living in a reptilian Anunnaki society? Well, it is not only their architecture. Much of this has been shared throughout various star systems. Keep in mind the Anunnaki. They are one of the oldest cosmic families in this universe. And their lineage and bloodline runs through the Pleiadians just as much as it does through your own human collective. So, so just because in a certain location, the Pleiadians may have come and adapted an area very similar to what they had learned or known in their own star system does not make it exclusive to their race. Uh, the Anunnaki would have designed things very similar. Now, uh, we're talking about the cross earlier, and of course the cross is used in many religions, uh, Christian, Catholic religions, for example, today. And uh, now in ancient Indian architecture also, we, we will often see the swastika, uh, same thing in Ethiopia. So it seems like a lot of the reptilian um, places around the world that were created by reptilian beings, we will see the swastika or the cross. Now, is a swastika similar to the cross uh, in ancient uh, in its ancient usage, or is it a different kind of symbol that is reptilian in nature or more universal? It is not necessarily reptilian, but it is an adaptation of a light language or a code that has been used in in various um, ancient civilizations. We might say throughout the cosmos. But again, remember, it has become translated here on planet Earth to represent what it is. And it is somewhat a capture of energy like a portal. We use the term portal lightly because we know that we've explained a great deal about portals on the Earth and, and how they work and, and how they are a place where energy becomes exchanged. But but portals can be used for a great many things, even to share certain messages that are undetectable by the human mind. Um, it is very much like if a human soul were to speak a language of light today, there may be a transmission that a group of humans receive and they are able to feel the energy of it, but they do not know exactly what the the translation of the words are that they have just been offered and this is a slippery slope because if we do not know the translation of a language of light we must rely on how we feel and so we implore everyone to look at this symbol and feel within themselves what it evokes it is a portal through which certain messages can be sent and if it is focused on in a negative light it will hold that negativity in such a way that darkness will prevail. Even going back to some of the Anunnaki um, timelines and, and history, we see this very prominently used in their home star system, technologically and otherwise, in order to send collective messages. So, so we see this more as um, 
a show of power, in other words, because those that had access to this symbol or technology were often the ones who were responsible for leading entire civilizations or communities. They would use this symbol not to say one thing, but to relay an urgent message in which all would receive and prepare to act upon. Uh, very similar today to how it has been used throughout history, uh, but also taken more out of context on earth than what we are speaking of. What was the significance of Hitler choosing it as an emblem for or his movement? Was it, um, was it to use in the way you're speaking of, or was he simply just in his pursuit of finding his ancestors, um, which was a great deal of his motivation in what he was doing, was he just simply using that symbol because he saw it as an emblem of his ancestry? We, we, we believe it is a show of his ancestry, a, a demonstration of it. Because keep in mind that there were many human hybrids on the earth at the time, just like there are today, and, and even intergalactic beings of multiple dimension that roam the earth that are undetectable to the human eye. So, so this would have been a demonstration of his lineage in order to attract the energy, wisdom, and information of those who may be of a similar bloodline. I'd like to move now to discussing some of the architectural differences in um, other places around the world, beginning with Egypt, for example. We see very different architectural style in Egypt versus these other places we discussed where we see the reptilian structures tend to be carved into rock, um, like Kailasa Temple. There were no blocks that were stacked. They, they carved the entire structure out of one um, big rock formation. Uh, and the same is true of the, um, of the site we discussed in Ethiopia where we uh, see differences in Egypt, for example, is um, the most ancient structures tend to have gigantic blocks that were um, stacked on top of each other. So it wasn't where a mountain location, for example, a rock formation was chosen out of which the entire structure was carved in one piece, but rather individual blocks were stacked. And even as the, the, the civilization became less advanced, the block sizes got smaller, but they were still using blocks. So uh, now I assume that this is because the Egyptian civilization was initiated through Thoth and, and Anunnaki lineage in conjunction with reptilian, but, but primarily, primarily their influence. And the Anunnaki, I assume, have this different kind of architectural style. Is that reasonable? It is true that there is more of an Anunnaki influence that you are seeing in the structures in Egypt. However, it would be uh, wrong of us to not also include uh, the Syrians as well as the Orion Council. Uh, Egypt was a very interesting civilization because unlike some of the ones that we have been talking about that have been very prominently reptilian or very prominently Anunnaki, there was a gathering, um, almost a melting pot of, of a variety of different races and, and degrees of human hybridization of those races. So there was input, we might say, from these different races and their background, as well as their, their technologies. Thoth being a, a primary part of that influence is, is showing us or demonstrating, of course, the, the Anunnaki influence. But, but we do want to speak for a moment uh, to the blocks because it is demonstrating a different technological manifestation here than what the reptilians were using. And and again, we want to remind everyone that this is an outer technology. It is not existent within the physical body. So it must assume to be working with the actual earth. And, and this is what happened. Now, some of these um, various locations that are, are pyramids or temples were assisted 
in their construction by lightships that came in and used various templates through which light and sound were injected in order to make perfect cuts in rock or granite. But the levitation of these pieces, uh, they were done using an, an even different form of technology uh, that is somewhat telepathic in its manifestation, uh, meaning the technology itself was not necessarily on earth at the time in which these blocks were used, but it was able to transcend through uh, the dimensions of earth and, and be programmed by those that were there in order to suit uh, a certain configuration. Uh, and the blocks are actually important. They do have importance because the number of blocks that were used were very significant in uh, creating the ideal structure itself. Uh, everything had a numerologic basis or, or some type of mathematical uh, configuration or equation uh, in the ability to create symmetry. So, so you're seeing the contribution uh, and influence of a variety of different beings, uh, their technologies, and how they were able to adapt them at the uh, time in which they were present on the earth. So would it be fair to say that the one difference that we see between the different architectural styles, the reptilians use more of a uh, inner body um, technology and mind-based technology to, to produce their architecture, which didn't require cutting or anything, um, whereas the uh, Egyptian civilization used more of a scientific external technology so for example today um, some sort of a ship that will use lasers to cut the blocks something like that this is this is correct uh yet we also want to draw some parallels between uh the way in which the anunnaki or those in egypt were constructing these pyramids and how the reptilians were able to construct theirs because the templates that were used by the ships, they were very similar to what the reptilians were able to accomplish through the third eye and the cuts that were made very exact. But alchemy was used in, in both of these processes, meaning that within a very dense and solid piece of material. Uh, several cuts could be made in order to form a block or to form an ornate design. And the remaining elemental material left behind and still efficiently used as a part of the structure. You're saying both the Anunnaki and the reptilians used the, the remaining debris as part of the structure. Correct. And, and that's why maybe we don't find the remnants of that. Although some archaeologists claim that there are actual quarry sites when where these blocks were carved and um, the empty opening is remaining. Is that is that just a misinterpretation then? It, it isn't necessarily a misinterpretation. In, in some of these locations, what you're seeing is the need to access a specific type of material that may not have been present on the site. Uh, for example, in some of these very elaborate and ornate chambers in pyramids, you're seeing the use of, of granite or a specific type of crystal. This may not have been available within the location that the pyramid was being constructed. And a ship would have gone to a specific area in order to extract it from that area and to move it and use it in a very specific way. So it isn't necessarily a quarry that um, material was moved from, but a, a valuable part of the land that was found and necessary to be added. Some archaeologists, in particular academic archaeologists, believe that the um, Egyptian complex in Giza, for example, is only maybe four or five thousand years old. 
but um, more unconventional or alternative archaeologists and geologists, uh, for example, have dated many of those structures back to 13,000 years ago. Now, w did these structures, were they 13,000 years old uh, back to around the time of the cataclysm we've discussed many times, or did, did they even pre-exist that in Egypt? Not necessarily pre-existing the cataclysm, but, but certainly very close after is when these structures were constructed. And it is not to say that some of them were not existent before the cataclysm. Uh, some of them were actually repaired and, and restored in order for new uh, cosmic families and beings to inhabit. So many of these structures pre-existed the flood then, the the cataclysm? Yes, yes. Okay. So we've discussed many times that Thoth was responsible for the architecture of the original complex that's there. Now, if we go to Giza today, there are many structures layered on top of structures. So some may have been built on top of them, which we also see that in many other sites around the world. Um, so the when we're referring to Thoth having built them, did he also design and build the very original beginning uh, sites in Egypt as well, or just from 13,000 years ago? Well, well, Thoth is an interdimensional being who was in this area even prior to being known as Thoth, and actually um, coming to the Earth on various ships in order to pre-plan and to observe uh, what would be accomplished during the lifetime in which he was known as Thoth. So, so we can contribute his, uh, or we can attribute his contribution uh, to almost all of these structures, but not necessarily in the form in which he is known as such. And, and so the architectural styles that we see that are quite different in Egypt and, and also other similar sites around the world um, in terms of the block cutting and so on, that is, is that in particular uh, Thoth's design or his, um, now he's Anunnaki, is that because it's Anunnaki type of design structure? Uh, well, we want to clarify that even though there was a great deal of Anunnaki influence, that there was a great deal of collaboration going on in Egypt. And and we want to go back to Atlantis, for example, and 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 remind you of a great deal of Syrian influence, especially Syrian elders who came to to found uh, that civilization and contribute to the technologies that were there. Uh, many of these Syrians also found their way into Egypt and and offered some of their knowledge of various architectural designs, uh, calling upon their home planet in order to support them. So, so even though Thoth might have been uh, the the orchestrator or or even the the engineer at times, uh, he was collaborating with a great many others that he called upon who had. Uh, a variety of different uh, skill sets uh, and and knowledge in these areas. Now, in particular, when we look at the, the Great Pyramid and the other uh, two pyramids that are immediately in that area and the Sphinx, for example, the Sphinx appears to have more weathering and some geologists have um, come to the conclusion that the Sphinx actually is about 13,000 years old and... Um, was there during the time of a great flood that caused this water weathering or at least significant rainfall. Um, was, was the Sphinx one of the original structures in that location or were there um, were, were the Great Pyramid and the others also there? Uh, in fact, it, it is one of the first. It is the oldest of all of the structures in this area. There's a lot of speculation among many researchers as to the the face on the sphinx and the body being disproportional the head is very small compared to the body and of course it looks like a pharaoh today many um, conventional archaeologists believe it to be one of the more recent pharaohs um, also responsible for, they attribute it responsible to building of the pyramids as well but some other researchers believe it was a lion head um, that was facing um, uh, the the constellation of Leo at the time that it was built, uh, which would have been true around that time period. 
Um, others believe it's a jackal head, um, in, in particular referencing Anubis, for example. Um, and, and some believe that it was originally Thoth's fa uh, head that was created on the Sphinx. So do you have any uh, information on that? This structure in particular is represented, representative of the Syrian influence and the Syrian human hybrids that first came to, to found this area. Uh, and it certainly did have, um, uh, an interesting, uh, formation, not necessarily that the head was meant to be much smaller than the body, but, but it was showing the way in which the hybridization was actually starting to take shape because many of the Syrians that arrived here were very tall and, and very, um, large in stature but also began to adapt uh, as they became closely connected to, to other beings and other humans. Um, this was also um, uh, an area in which the earth itself was able to be uh, observed and, and transformed by those that existed on the planet to do research for their own home star systems. Um, consider it somewhat like um, um, a, a place within the, the solar system that various um, humans on Earth today have the ability to measure and watch uh, what is happening as the Earth moves around it. Uh, this location was chosen to be focused upon Leo, not necessarily in order to only uh, honor that star system or that influence within the uh, galactic universe, but, but to help understand the orientation of the earth to a great many other uh, locations as well. Well, one of the other anomalies of the Sphinx is that the head not only being smaller, but it doesn't show any of the weathering patterns of rainfall or flooding that the body does. So the body's been reconstructed, it appears, by many civilizations that have uh, existed in that area. So it's believed that the head was later recarved, that it was originally a lot larger and maybe even a lion's head, but later recarved uh, because it was significantly weathered to look like the pharaoh that was there at the time. So are you saying that it was originally a lion head and the body was also a lion? Yes, that is what we are saying. But but of course, through time, what you are seeing is the malevolent focus of many who would have wished to change uh, the, the dynamics of these various structures in order to favor themselves. Uh, here at this temple, we're not necessarily seeing the deliberate addition of a head once the top had been destroyed, because there is a whole nother level that was existent before the flood that didn't just include a head necessarily, but included an entire docking station and, and land uh, landing pad uh, for ships that were entering the Earth's atmosphere. So, so what you're seeing in this structure today isn't exactly the entire picture. Okay, but just so I'm clear, originally the whole Sphinx structure that we're referring to was a lion then, body and head. Yes, correct. Okay. And at a later time, weathering happened and and the head was recarved or replaced by whoever the leader was at the time. Yes. Okay. And what you're saying is now the, the Sphinx also has a very um, large base that it sits on. When you're referring to a landing pad, is that what you mean? That it was it was originally a landing pad and later the Sphinx was added? Or there's a landing pad that extends beyond the Sphinx that was yeah. used? We are speaking beyond the Sphinx, the Sphinx, uh, above and beyond it. Okay. And when you're saying landing pad, landing pad for ships of some sort? Correct. Okay. And this would have been all different races? Uh, it, it would have been all different races, yet we we know that not every race was using it in this way. Now, in, in, there are many structures in, in the Egyptian area, still many even discovered, being discovered today. And of course, the, the prevailing mainstream archaeological theory was that the pyramids, uh, let's just discuss for now, the three pyramids in Egypt, 
were built to house the bodies of pharaohs, although very few pharaohs were found, bodies or even body parts were ever found anywhere near the pyramids. But this was their theory that they were built for that purpose. But we've discussed before, they were built more for a, a technological reason. Can you elaborate on on the, the now Thoth designed it? I assume he designed in all three of them. Is that correct? Uh, he did. And if we are to go into detail about the technological significance of the pyramids, we would have to go beyond even Egypt, because while many would focus only on these pyramids, what we know to be true is that there's a pyramid complex, an, an entire collective of them that are strategically placed on the earth in various locations in order to create and hold a field, very much like um, what we have discussed in uh, Atlantis, where the pyramids there were purposely connected to earthly elements in order to create a coherent field and keep the vibration of that civilization very high. Uh, the pyramids on planet Earth are, are somewhat simulate, simulating a similar field while each individual one has its own specific intentions. So, so there is somewhat a collective technological purpose for the pyramids that exist um, within every civilization on earth, even though Thoth may have not been the one in charge of creating them, uh, there's an intelligence to this process based upon the contribu contribution of many intergalactic beings who have been on the earth uh, throughout ancient history. And this is truly yet to be fully revealed and understood. There are even pyramids that you have yet to discover that lie deep within the earth that uh, have been uh, shielded by the the weather or certain elements that are a part of this configuration. Uh, but the three that you speak of are are aligned in such a way that universal coherence is held, and they're they're also a communication technology, not necessarily meant specifically to have direct conversations with galactic beings beyond the earth, but to help an individual to be able to become the technology itself and to exchange energy with the greater universe. Some of the chambers within these pyramids were designed specifically for activating masculine or feminine energy or the balance of both and others um, uh, focused upon physical healing and and some of this came much later so ultimately what you're looking at in the initial intention of thoth to bring these pyramids to fruition is to create a similar civilization in which cosmic energy was a very tangible force within a material world uh, and could be put to great use in order for energy for healing or for akashic insights well, there's a box that's inside of the Great Pyramid uh, that conventional archaeologists have said is a sarcophagus for the pharaoh, who they say built it. But it appears to be too small for your typical human body to go in. What was that used for originally? These chambers were, were often used as transmutation centers for energies that a soul had um, taken on that may have been perceived as evil or, or dark in nature. Uh, in fact, they often connect to an area of the pyramid that allows a certain vibrational field uh, to be accessed. Uh, it is either a very um, um, direct alignment with a specific planet uh, or able to capture the energy from the cosmos and bring it into the chamber itself. Now, later, of course, these pyramids were taken over or occupied by those in power. And, and it is not to say that they were intended to be used, these areas, as a sarcophagus, but of course, they would have been, uh, they would have wanted those in power uh, to stake claim uh, to these very valuable. Um, uh, technologies even long after their death, such that their lineage would live on. 
Well, there's some speculation that the biblical Ark of the Covenant was stored in this um, sarcophagus-like box in the Great Pyramid. Is there any truth to that? The Ark of the Covenant is not one entity or technology for a specific purpose. There are parts of it that have been scattered throughout uh, across the earth in very important locations that are very much similar in scope to why Thoth would have created the pyramids that he did. In other words, it is meant to hold a field or to access a specific um, uh, amount of energy and distribute it uh, in order for enlightenment or a, a raise in consciousness uh, to take shape. Now, we can say that an, an aspect of that ark would have been placed in Egypt because it is such a significant location on the earth. And of course, um, the various structures were there um, supporting uh, in parallel the same in intention of what the ark was meant to accomplish. Now, in of course, we know biblical texts have been modified and not necessarily literally uh, to be taken today, but in the in the Bible it does reference Moses as having taken the Ark of the Covenant and used it to part the waters. Um, so what was that, or was that just some uh, altered storyline? The Ark of the Covenant is a technology that you would not hold in your hand necessarily. For for if you did, uh, it would not sustain your life on planet earth it, it would take too much energy in order for a soul to be able to in a material sense interface with it uh, what those in biblical times we have been translating is that the ark was an initiatory process taken into the individual moses's heart or the knowledge of that arc being integrated and infused uh, within his mind, the, the courage and the confidence and the ability to use energy um, uh, plasmically and just as powerfully as we have been speaking to all along uh, to create something on the physical planet uh, that was somewhat seen as a miracle. So, so the Ark was left behind in strategic locations, not as one technology itself, but we'll say a series of instructional and translated um, um, stories uh, or, um, uh, there's not a good word for this that we can use, um, um, accounts of how those who had been trained uh, in transcendence uh, could share this training with others. Well, we've discussed in previous in the previous conversation how dolmens were used by the Pleiadians as portals. And if we as human beings were to go sit in a dolmen today, it wouldn't really assist us in our ascension process, but it may help us to connect with the dimensions that were represented by those portals or used originally. So if the seventh dimensional Pleiadian had used that, um, we may be able to connect with the seventh dimension by sitting in, in that portal. Now, we discussed briefly last time how the pyramids in Egypt are different in that they actually were designed with human development or ascension in, in mind. And so if we were to go sit in one of those structures today, they would help us to advance. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, well, these structures work very differently. So, so the, the, the most important difference to keep in mind between a dolmen and a pyramid is that the pyramid was constructed for the benefit of all, where, where the dolmen was more um, constructed for the benefit of those coming to earth and, and the specific needs that they had. So, so the difference would be in, in terms of a pyramid, and, and, and we have to speak to the commonality of all of them because we know you understand they are each an individual consciousness with different um, uh, intentions and, and abilities within them. Uh, but we will always go back time and time again 
to the communication channels that they open because ultimately what a pyramid is holding is an unbroken connection to universal energy and that includes the access of every dimension in this universe through the the three six nine and those who enter a pyramid are first through the pyramid itself becoming intimately and consciously aware of anything that stands in the way of their ability to do the same. So, so if you are a physical being mimicking the geometry of the universe, then within you, the three, six, nine exists. But unfortunately through time, um, and, and a great deal of influence, that connection has been broken or it has been trained out of you. So the pyramid is helping a soul to reorient itself to its cosmic connections and to relieve itself of anything that stands in the way or breaks the, the chain of communication that is innate within it. And, and this is a very um, broad statement we are making because we know you understand that every individual that enters a pyramid is going to be at a different level of consciousness with a different vibration with blocks within them and patterns that maybe may need to be changed. So a pyramid will set a soul on a path of true internal healing through and by which if it is willing, uh, it will see very visually and vividly all of the things that stand in the way of its, its cosmic lineage and ability to connect to all dimensions at will. So in comparing that to dolmens, pyramids obviously would help human beings to advance or to reconnect to the 369. Um, how does that, is that similar or different from, let's say in India, for example, a lot of these reptilian temples like Halasa, a lot of people go there to meditate or to worship their deity. Is there any benefit to that structure? There, there are benefits and they are a, a bit different. Now, the ornate nature of these temples, they hold the Akashic relevance of, of history and many of the timelines and stories that are, are relevant to a soul's training. So, so just being in close proximity to various geometries and uh, carvings, for example, uh, will awaken within the DNA of this, the soul um, relevant timelines that uh, historically come back from their lifetimes and help them to become a more expanded version of self. In many instances, we look at the reptilian structures that are called temples a bit more like a stargate. And there is a slight distinction between a portal and a stargate. A stargate is accessing some Akashic relevant timeline energy that supports what the intention of those in the temple uh, are focused on. Uh, for example, uh, many speak today on planet Earth of, Earth of Christ consciousness and want to be ordained in the, the connection to the Christed timelines or some of the lifetimes that they have been a part of these various storylines. It is possible uh, to enter a stargate in an area in which um, Christ, for example, or Mary Magdalene may have left behind some divination or symbology. And these are immediate downloads. Uh, these areas offer a soul a transcendent ability to step into its own history and the history of those that have gone before it for a very specific purpose. So, so while they work somewhat the same, um, there is a slight difference. And of course it is all dependent upon the structure itself. What about the structures you said uh, that are in Petra Jordan that uh, were Pleiadian in nature? Is there any residual energy or benefit to those structures? The energy that exists there would be somewhat uplifting and higher vibrational, we believe, simply because of the way that the vibration through the earth is being channeled. Anytime that a human is in close proximity to a natural environment and that natural environment is enhanced in some way, uh, they will receive the healing benefit. But these 
areas are not necessarily constructed to be portals. The activities that go on within them, um, having a certain energetic quality uh, is meant to be expanded or, or somehow um, um, shared widely uh, with the collective. Also, as we mentioned, the pillar construction with the triangular roof uh, forms somewhat of a directional frequency or energy from the earth or the activities inside the structure. So there are some who could come together, for example, and meditate or pray in these areas. And this could have a very profound uh, impact uh, on the collective as a whole. Uh, the same is true in the opposite, uh, meaning that uh, groups could gather and uh, also simulate ceremonies that are harmful in nature and lower the vibration of those who receive its energy. Okay, we're going to end there for today, and we'll continue next time. So thank you, Michaela. You're welcome. And thank you all for joining us for another Channel of Revelations. <laughs> We'll be back again next week with another Awaken Empowered podcast. And, of course, we are on many platforms now, uh, including uh, Rumble with video and uh, different podcast platforms like Apple or uh, Google, for example, or Spotify. And we also do have some of our content on Odyssey as well. So if you uh, prefer one of those platforms, you can find us there as well. So we'll see you next week.